I'm with the Office of Development and Events here at our temporary home with the American Legion in Sharon, Connecticut, ably joined by Ann Thompson from the Essex Library. And of course, our technical guru is Gretchen Hockmeister, who um, is our Zoom Meister. Um, and so thank you, Gretchen, for making sure all the buttons and things get pressed in the right order. And Anne, for bringing your um, interesting Essex energy and, and resources to all these programs. They're a lot of fun. Um, the, the, uh, our welcome slide had a, just a, 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 a short listing of our events coming up. We've got a very busy fall between here and the end of the year. Next week's, I'll, I'll only mention that next week's, um, next Thursday is an evening called Postering Sharon. That's a, a really interesting story about what happened when we moved out of our old library after many years and what we found in a drawer. And the lesson is why libraries should never throw anything out. So it's a really interesting history that, that uh, history of the town and the area that, that uh, we'll have a couple of um, experts talking about what the, what, what the treasures we found, what they tell us. And so that's next week at uh, seven o'clock. And I know that Anne's got some things coming up at the Essex Library and you should certainly check their, their website because they're, they're a busy crowd as well. Um, a great smorgasbord of programs between now and, and the end of the year. But tonight, the main course is about the last and the best one, and that's about desserts. If you're like me, if you're a cook like me, you always find yourself walking that very fine line between a good meal for those and for, for yourself and those you care about, and the time and attention that the rest of your time, the rest of your life takes away. Makes cooks like me all the happier to welcome the person who took a very basic kitchen implement and used it as a magic wand to give us the ability to cook great food even while real life goes on. Molly Gilbert started the sheet pan craze with sheet pan suppers back in 2014. Hard to imagine life without it. And she put this magic together from her education at the French Culinary Institute, from cooking for a family of enthusiastic eaters. She's a blogger, she's a recipe tester, and really she's our new best friend, who's going to make the upcoming holiday baking and eating season all that much better. So live from sunny Seattle, we want to welcome Molly Gilbert. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, everybody. Hi, from Seattle. Um, so today I'm going to just dive right in because we are making an apple fritter cake from my new cookbook, which is called Sheet Pan Sweets. And I'm baking it live here. I don't, it's not like TV cooking. I don't have anything pre-made. So I want to make sure that we get through the whole recipe. Um, so apple fritter cake is super easy to come together. We're not going to be using any mixers or electronics. All we need is a couple of bowls, some whisks and spatulas. You will see um, how simple. And so I'm just going to show you what I've got down here. Obviously, a sheet pan. All of the recipes in this particular book are baked on a sheet pan. And when I say a sheet pan, professionally, they're called a half sheet. And they uh, measure 18 by 13 inches. And they have this little one inch lip around the edge. It's important to use the right size pan so that you don't have any like overflowing situations in the oven, which I've had happen, and it's just no fun. Um, I'm going to spray that with a little bit of cooking spray here just to get it prepped. You could also use butter, but in the interest of time, this is great. Um, so I'm going to set that aside. That's ready for when we need it. Um, and then for our dry ingredients, all I need is a little bit of all-purpose flour. I'm going to mix some kosher salt and some baking soda in there. Make sure we get it all in. And then I've got our nice fall spices. I have a lot of ground cinnamon and a little bit of ground nutmeg. And that's it for the dry ingredients. Just gonna give those a little whisk. Get them all happy in the bowl. Okay, and set that aside. And for the wet ingredients, we start with two cups of brown sugar which sounds like a lot, but when you're making a full sheet cake, you have to keep in mind that it's gonna be a really big final product here. Um, so two cups is not actually all that bad. Um, I'm gonna to add to that four eggs and a cup of canola oil. You can use any sort of like mild flavorless oil um, for this, which is nice. And yeah, let's see, just gonna whisk this in. Get it happy in the pan. I also have, I'm oh, sorry, in the bowl, not the pan. Um, 
I've got a stick of butter that I've melted and cooled here in my pot. I'm gonna add that as well to the wet ingredients. Make sure we get it all in there. Don't wanna leave any behind. And I'm gonna save this pot because I'm going to use it to make some brown butter for the glaze that goes on top of this cake. Um, and then a touch of vanilla extract. Um, could measure this out. I like to just eyeball it. And a touch of almond extract. You gotta be careful and just add a touch of that too because I find if you go overboard on the extracts, it can be a little bit too much. Um, but that should do it. It smells really, really good. What I love about this apple fritter cake is I just, I mean, I love apple fritters. So obviously that was the inspiration behind this cake. This is in the breakfast and bread section of my book, Sheet Pan Sweets. Um, and I love eating apple fritters, but I don't love making them at home because they're a little fussy with the hot oil and the standing and the frying um, and, you know, doing individual ones. So I wanted to do a sheet cake apple fritter, basically. So obviously it's without the frying, but you still get those pockets of gooey apple. We're covering it in like a sweet mapley glaze. So that's the whole vibe that we're going for apple fritters, but ones that you can just slice up and serve um, or just eat yourself. Um, so I've got the wet ingredients here, the dry ingredients here. All I'm gonna do is add the dry into the wet. Make sure we added everything so far, yes. Okay, and then I'm gonna, gonna um, switch to my spatula. But before I do that, the one ingredient that we can't forget is apples. So I've pre-cut a bunch of apples here. We're gonna need about four cups, but I will show you how I like to best cut and peel my apples. Um, I'm using a mix of different apples here, but I really like using Granny Smith for baking. Um, I'm just gonna cut off the top and the bottom. These, I like these wide peelers, which I find just really easy and simple. They don't like get stuck on the apple. and They're easy to control. I'm just taking it and going top to bottom to take off the skin here. I like using Granny Smith's for baking because they're nice and tart. They're not too sweet. Um, and they're also a really good texture. They're really firm and they hold their shape in this cake. Um, I, I like to usually mix it up. I do a mix of these green Granny Smith's and then usually Golden Delicious or um, maybe a Honey Crisp if that's what I've got. Um, but you could really use any kind of apple you have on hand. It's a pretty forgiving cake. So you don't have to get too fussy with the type of apple that you're using. Um, and if you were feeling extra lazy and you didn't want to peel a bunch of apples, this came from about three, this is three and a half apples, um, which gets you about four cups. If you didn't want to peel, you'd be okay. Um, I prefer the apples peeled because I think the texture in the cake is a little bit better. You don't get like a, you know, a bite of apple peel in your cake, but again, it would work with the peels, it would still taste delicious. Um, this is quite a forgiving cake, which I really, I really like. I like that it's easy. You can, you know, make certain substitutes, like I said, different apples. I use dark brown sugar, but if you wanted to use light brown, that would also be okay. Um, so I'm just folding the dry ingredients into the wet here. And you don't have to be too precious or gentle with it. I just don't want it to spill over this bowl here. So that's why I'm folding, just going around the bowl, catch any of the kind of stray pieces of flour and mix them right in. And then before it gets completely smooth, I'm gonna pour in my apples. I still have a bunch of like streaks and chunks of flour in here. So in go the apples. And this is really chock full of apples here, which I love because it just it gives the cake some really good heft and body. And it's really reminiscent 
of an apple fritter with those warm apple-y pockets throughout. To me, there's sort of nothing better in the donut case than an apple fritter, preferably one that's still a little bit warm from the fryer with that sweet glaze on top. Okay, so the apples are all folded in here. I'm gonna pour it into my pan. See if I can do this facing, facing the camera without getting it all over me. <laughs> it smells delicious. The sweetness of the apples are coming through. I'm getting those like warm fall, cinnamony, nutmeggy spices. And then butter, obviously. It and looks like it's, it looks like it smells delicious. It mm. smells very good. I wish we had smell a vision. It's the one thing that Zoom hasn't quite figured out yet. <laughs> okay. So I've got my batter in the pan. I'm going to use this offset spatula, this big one, just to spread it all out. Make sure that every bit of the pan gets covered and to evenly distribute these apples. It might look a little bit scant in the pan, but it'll bake up fluffy and it'll fill out the pan as it bakes. Okay. And this is just a handy tool to have around, especially for sheet cakes and things on this large sheet pan because it just has this big surface area. It's really easy to push the batters around the pan. Okay, so that's it for the apple cake batter. I'm gonna put it in the oven here. Um, this recipe calls for the oven to be at 325. I have mine on 350. Just in the sake of time here, I wanna make sure that it bakes in the allotted time that we have. Um, and now I'm just going to kind of tidy a little bit and gather the ingredients that we need to make the glaze. So get some of this out of your frame. And for the glaze, all we need is some powdered sugar, some more butter, and actually I'm going to put this in my pot that I haven't cleaned out yet. I'm gonna turn that on to like medium lowish. Medium, actually. So what I wanna do is brown the butter. I'm not gonna step very far away from it because whenever I'm browning butter, if I step away, it will inevitably burn. So I'm gonna stick close by and use my, my auditory cues. Um, hopefully you guys will be able to hear this as it's going, but as the butter starts to melt, it'll start to bubble. Um, once it's like bubbling up a lot, that means the butter solids are sort of separating from the clarified butter, basically. So you'll kind of see the change. And then once the butter stops bubbling up violently and I, you won't hear it as much, it'll kind of like just more quietly boil. That's when you really want to pay attention that's when it will start browning. All those milk solids on the bottom of the pan will start to get nice and brown. Um, so I'm gonna be listening for that as we go here. But I have some powdered sugar. I have some more cinnamon and a touch of salt. And then I have two tablespoons of pure maple syrup mm. and a tablespoon of milk. And that will be all we need for the glaze. But the brown butter is really what kind of brings it all together and makes it smell amazing, it makes it taste amazing. I've got my butter melting, but it's definitely not browning yet. I'll show you the pot as we go. I know it's kind of far away, but I'm gonna turn up the heat ever so slightly so we're on like medium, medium, medium high. I'm just gonna listen for that. And so as the cake bakes and as we wait for the butter to brown, um, I'm very happy to take any questions, to talk about the book, other recipes in the book, 
um, to any of my other cookbooks. So if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat box. And um, can, can I, I'll just jump in quickly while people get them in the chat box, uh, just about the, the cooking by ear. The, uh, do you, as a trained cook and somebody with a lot of experience with testing things, it, is that a skill you've developed? Is it, there are lots of places you can use when you're listening to the food to tell where it is in its cooking stage? Yeah, you know, I feel like cooking is something that uses all of your senses. Um, so you don't think of like hearing as one that you would necessarily use, right. you're, but you can hear the butter right now starting yeah. to bubble up. Um, yeah, and it's just something that I've been able to hone a little bit as I've been testing and cooking and, you know, doing all this baking in my life. Um, brown butter is one of my favorite things to make. So um. I, it's funny because I was thinking about it just, I think it was last night when I was cooking something and there was a book a year, a couple of years ago that I heard it, a, 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 a piece about it on NPR about cooking by ear. And they had all these different sounds and it was it's like, well, duh, why didn't we think of that? Because it really is quite obvious to some, you know, in many ways. It yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Obviously, like your nose is a really big one while you're, when baking and cooking in general, like once I start smelling something in the oven, that's how I know, that's my first cue to check on it and make sure that it's not yeah. done. Um, but yes, listening, obviously looking, and then touch is a big one as well. When I take the cake out of the oven, I'll kind of press on it a little bit. I'll see, is it springy? Is it leaving an indent when I when I push? If, if it is, then it needs some more time in the oven. Sure. I'm gonna show you, if you can, I don't know if you'll be able to see this exactly because I don't wanna burn it, but, oh, it's all going down to the bottom of the pot. <laughs> There's some white bubbles on top and then some like yellow. Of course, you can't see anything, can you? Um, well, we'll, we'll believe you, we take your, we take your word for it. <laughs> I need a see-through pot, that's what I need. Um, but the white, the little white pieces on top are the milk solids that are kind of separating from the kind of yellow clarified butter. And those are bubbling up, but once they start to sink to the bottom and aren't bubbling quite as violently, then they'll start to brown. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, often you'll hear, a recipe say once butter reaches the amber stage, and that just means it's kind of like a reddish brown color. Um, and at that point, you want to take it off the heat because the butter will continue to cook in the, the residual heat from the pan. So once it's at the color that I want it to be, I'll either add something directly to the pot to cool it down, or in this case, I'm going to pour the butter into a different vessel so that it stops cooking and it doesn't go too far. Okay, so it's starting to slow down. You can hear it, the boil isn't quite as frenzied. I'm gonna take my spatula and just move it around the pan. And that will help the milk solids just move so that they don't sit and brown at the bottom of the pot. And now you can hear it's almost stopped making noise. It's just like a very kind of light here and now a little sound. And it's brown. So we can pour it in and we'll see what, what you guys can see. Oh, nice. So all these little brown bits at the bottom of the pot, I want to make sure that I include because that's a ton of flavor in there. I'm just going to kind of scrape it. If you do take it a little too far and there are some bits that are burned, don't yeah. worry about scraping the pot. Just kind of pour off the part that you can use and leave the kind of burning bits. Um, but I actually didn't really didn't get too many in there today. Yeah, but you're know. a professional. Come on. <laughs> Even us professionals burn the butter on occasion. Yeah. Um, okay, so I've got the butter in with my powdered sugar. I'm going to start whisking that in. I'm going to add the cinnamon and the salt. I think I'm going to need to add more liquid to get this going. It's going to kind of clump up. So I'm going to add my two tablespoons of maple syrup. Hmm. And the maple syrup and the brown butter in this is just like, just like chef's kiss. It's so tasty. 
so fall, autumn, all the vibes. Um, is, this a, is this a glaze recipe that you developed yourself or is inspired by something else or? Um, I, I developed this one myself. I mean, I'm always inspired by other recipes and I often feel like in the kitchen, yeah. there's really anything that's brand new. It's just sort of right. new to us or new. A different you know. take on it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But I do, I do love, I wanted to incorporate a little bit of maple flavor because I feel like even if it's not traditionally an apple fritter thing, it sort of gets at that core of that fall apple, you know, warm sure. feeling. Okay. So this is starting to smooth out a little bit, but it's still clumpy. So we're going to add the milk. And this is just whole milk. You could also use you know, half and half heavy cream. If you wanted to kind of really make it extra rich or you could use 2% milk if that's what you've got. So this is now loosening up nicely. It's warm, but it's cooling down as I whisk and as I added that milk, it cooled it a bit. So this is kind of perfect. It's the perfect consistency. That's great. And the consistency is best while it's warm, right? Because once it once it warm once it cools off, it it gets a little thicker. Doesn't yes. pour quite so well. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're going to see how this works actually today. What I'm going to do is leave my bowl on top of the oven, which is slightly warm from the heat of the um, baking cake. So hopefully that will keep it warm enough and kind of pliable enough that what I like to do is I just use my whisk and sort of like drizzle pollock it all over the finished cake. Perfect. Starting to smell the apple cake just a bit, I think, unless, unless it's just the brown butter that I'm smelling. But I'm gonna leave this on top of the oven here. I will close by. Then <laughs> take my trusty oven gloves. <laughs> my sister got me and I thought it was a joke at first. I was like, these are Mickey Mouse hands. Right, exactly. What but they work so great. So the joke was on me. Okay, it's definitely not ready yet, but it is starting to kind of puff up on the sides a little bit. I'll take these off. Sure. Um, Do you want to tell us a little bit more about uh, the book while we're while we're waiting with? Yes, while absolutely. We're waiting for the dessert. Yeah, it's got. A, I've so I've been looking yearningly at it. It's got you know you got six different, six different sections and all these different kinds of cookies and breakfast breads and layered and rolled cakes and maybe yeah. give us a couple of different examples of both absolutely. every day and the extreme. Yes, I mean, I'm obviously biased, but I love this book. Um, obviously, everything's on a sheet pan, sheet pan sweets. The chapters in this book are broken up into starting with sheet cakes, which I love because obviously it makes a ton of cake. So if, you know, you have a kid's birthday party or any birthday party, or if you're baking for the big sale or, um, you know, you have a holiday party, something coming up. A sheet cake is just, it's a great thing to serve because it, you can make one recipe, one pan of something and it will serve at least 24 people depending on how big or small you cut slices. But I have everything in here from um, the cover recipe, which is one of my favorites. It's, I call it Jack's chocolate chip cake. Um, Jack is my son who is four and on his third birthday, he requested this cake and it became one of my favorites. Um, I've got carrot cake, I have a chocolate pear cake, a double chocolate cake, like a scoopable German chocolate crater cake. Um, I find sheet cakes, something about sheet cakes just so nostalgic. You know, they remind me of my little kid birthday parties. Um, and I also love that you can serve them straight from the pan and the frosting to cake ratio is really, it's my <clears throat> preferred frosting to cake ratio because you get you know, a one layer of cake and then you pile that frosting on. It's just sort of, it's not exactly one-to-one, -one, but it's pretty close. <laughs> um, after the sheet cakes, we move into the uh, rolled and layered cake section of the book. Mm. Um, this is really fun because I like making layered cakes, but it can be a little bit stressful dealing with the different pans and rotating them in the oven and, you know, bringing out all your round cake pans or something. With these recipes, you just bake one sheet. You bake a sheet cake, and then you either cut out circles or squares to stack on top of each other to make your layered cake, um, which I just think it's kind of 
it makes sense. Um, everything cooks at the same rate. It cooks fairly quickly because there's not as much volume of cake in the pan. You know, it's not as deep in the pan as if you were using like an eight inch round cake or something like that. Um, and then I have rolled cakes as well, so. I'm looking at the mint chocolate chip meringue roll. Yes, that is one of my favorites. Actually. And if I could travel via Zoom to Seattle, I would do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this, the concept of rolled cakes is something that seems very kind of fussy, frilly, difficult, um, but I've tried to sort of pare it down and make it as easy as possible. I think one of the scariest things about it is that you're working with a hot cake because um, to make the roll, you turn out the cake while it's warm and roll it up in like a dish towel or sheet, a big sheet of parchment or something. And the reason you do that is to give the cake some muscle memory so that when you, when it's cool and you unroll it and then fill it and re-roll it, it won't crack because it sort of has a memory of, okay, this is the way I'm supposed to be shaped. Um, and yeah, again, it's something that sounds difficult, but that it's really not. And it looks impressive and it looks difficult, um, but you know, using just a sheet pan. And if you have something, something like this, where you're not going to be afraid to be touching the hot pan, it makes it really, really simple. And I've, I hopefully I've kind of laid out all the steps, simple, easy, straightforward enough that you feel comfortable and confident making a rolled cake. Um, I hope everyone will at least try that mint chocolate chip meringue roll. Sorry, I just there it is. You don't have to roll it while it's still warm. So maybe start with that one. Um, this was inspired by a baker named Zoe Francois, who is based in Minneapolis and who has her own baking books, a ton of them. Um, her newest one is called Zoe Bakes Cakes, I think. Um, and she has it. Oh, oh yeah, I follow her on Instagram, of course. Yeah. And she's amazing. I follow on Instagram. Um, mm -hmm. She has one in her cookbook that's like a, a rhubarb. I think it's a stewed rhubarb and cream meringue roll. Um, and I went the mint chocolate chip root, but it's a really, really fun recipe to make. Uh, let's see. After the layered and rolled cakes section, uh, we move into bars, cookie bars. And one of the really nice things about doing bars on a sheet pan, like I said, it's just the sheer volume. You know, like you can make a giant pan of brownies instead of a little eight by eight pan. Um, so whether you just like want a lot of brownies to freeze and have on hand for later, or you're gonna bring them, you know, to your neighbors or to a party or something, um, bars on a sheet pan is just a really good call. In fact, this Thanksgiving, I am going to be, I usually, I'm in charge of dessert, obviously, and um, I usually make like at least four pumpkin pies. I'm just going to make a sheet, a sheet pan of pumpkin pie bars this year. That's a great idea. Wow. Um, so I've got a lot of different stuff in here for all different tastes. Black and white cookie bars. Um, oh, and then we move on to cookies. You can't have a sheet, a sheet cake or a sheet pan book without including cookies. So I have, again, I tried to do a nice mix of different textures and flavors and colors and, um, you know, these are my kitchen sink cookies. These happen to be gluten-free. Um, and there's a, a good handful of gluten-free recipes in here, if that's your thing. These are also gluten-free chocolate kisses. Oh. Yeah. After the cookie chapter, um, there's kind of the pie fruit ish chapter. So everything from like a slab pie. This is a cranberry gingerbread galette. Um, we've got, so this is a slab pie. I call it my four stripe fruit pie. <laughs> <laughs> four different stripes of fruit fillings in there. So wow. sort of something for everyone. And that's actually one of the more fussy recipes in the book. I've sort of tried to keep everything really simple and pared down but obviously you're making four different types of fillings here. Um, so that just requires a bunch of bowls and stuff. Um, but again, trying to keep it as simple and streamlined as possible. This is one of the easiest, most streamlined recipes. It's slow roasted tipsy peaches. Those mm. are fun, especially in the summertime. And then the last section of the book is the one we're baking from today, breakfast and breads. I just love brunch and I love starting the day off with something sweet. Um, so I have all different kinds of stuff in here. 
Um, I have scone recipe. The one we're doing today is this apple fritter cake. Um, I have a blueberry muffin cake in here. So if you don't want to scoop, you know, 24 different individual blueberry muffins, you can just make this cheat cake of kind of blueberry muffin inspired um, cake and then slice it up into pieces. Um, and it's kind of same, same deal as serving individual muffins, but in squares instead. This is another favorite. I, I call it a dozen donut cake. And it's just a cake that is like heavily flavored with nutmeg for that donut flavor. Um, and then you can kind of stripe on different toppings to make it look like you're opening a box of a dozen different donuts. But it's just like powdered sugar, cinnamon sugar, and then a super quick glaze um, that comes together very quickly. Um, this one is my cinnamon roll poke cake. So again, instead of having to make, you know, 12 cinnamon, you know, making the cinnamon roll dough, waiting for it to rise, cutting however many you're going to make, um, you just make a sheet cake and then poke holes in it and fill the holes with that gooey, ooey cinnamon roll filling and top it with the cream cheese frosting. So I think I normally make cinnamon rolls um, Christmas morning, but I might do this one this year. And what's nice about this is you can make it the night before and then just cut slices in the morning. And if you want that like warm cinnamon roll feeling, um, you can just kind of microwave sure. on you know, do, a bit. Do, do, readers, do your readers ever annoy you by asking if they can make, if they can cut the recipes in half? Um, yes, which is totally fine. I'm happy to answer questions like that. If you have um, a half sheet pan, I'm sorry, a quarter, quarter sheet, sheet pan. pan. Right, right, right. I'll show you. I have a couple. So these are these really cute little yeah. mini guys. Um, most of the recipes in the book can be halved if you don't want to be dealing with a giant sheet. Um, I mean, clearly, clearly some of them need to be the whole thing, but something like the you know, if we made the apple fritter cake for 24, we would probably actually eat it all. So it's better to maybe make it for 12. <laughs> right. If you're not cooking for a giant crowd, but you still want to try something, yes, a quarter sheet pan would work for, especially for something like this cake. Yeah. Um, so let's take a look. This is looking really, really close. I'm going to show you. Okay. So we've, we've baked up here. It's browning. I can tell that the center of this is not quite done. When I push on it, it leaves an indent in the cake and it's still a little bit light colored. What I want is a springy cake that doesn't, my finger doesn't leave a dent and I want it to gently start pulling away from the sides of the pan, which it hasn't done yet. So I think this needs probably five more minutes-ish, but it smells divine. Molly, I know that you spent some time as a, a, a recipe tester, and I think that's where I probably first ran across your name was in Severe Magazine, maybe? But did um, that could be. I could be. I was a um, in a recipe tester in the test kitchen for Severe a very long time ago. Um, but that job was obviously great and amazing, especially for someone who loves writing recipes, developing recipes. Um, I was quite young when I was in that kitchen and I learned so much, everything from how to shop for a recipe, which sounds kind of silly, but um, yeah. it's a skill, you know, making yeah. the correct list with the correct amounts of ingredients, um, you know, separating things into produce, dry goods, just sort of getting your ducks in a row um, can save you a lot of time and hassle, uh, especially when you're, you know, testing multiple recipes at once. Um, so everything from shopping to um, recording and making sure that when you're testing recipes, you're really writing down everything so that later, you know, I've, I've definitely been guilty of trying to test something and just being like, okay, I'm going to remember that I used only this much amount of salt or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you go back later and you're like, wait, what, how much of this and that? So um, I learned some lessons in the civil test kitchen for a, uh, the pros of writing everything down. Um, but yes, that was a wonderful job. And it probably got you, it probably, I'm guessing it was really helpful in terms of preparing you to 
uh, do this kind of, you know, develop your own recipes and knowing what effect various ingredients and various processes are going to have on the outcome. Yes, definitely it did. Um, it was a much more professional, so I had been um, blogging for a couple of years before I got that job and it just, I mean, obviously developing recipes for a blog is a lot more informal, a lot look, less regimented than testing recipes for like an established magazine. Um, so I learned a lot about, you know, being really precise and um, writing really succinctly, you know, writing how, you know, the stuff, I'm not speaking in the way that I would do it, but making sure that everything is like as pared down and as simple as possible. So you're not kind of waxing poetic about this step or that step is like, here's what you do. And this is the order you do it and keep it clear so that people can follow the recipe successfully. Because that's ultimately what we want at the end of the day is for, you know, to share what we're doing, share these recipes and to have everybody have success in the kitchen while they're doing it. I, I, you must have eventually, in some of your time, run into recipes that really didn't work the well, the way the author would have hoped it would have worked, right? And that probably taught you some things as well. Absolutely. And I'm still, you know, nobody's perfect. I still run into those issues all the time. Um, I just actually found out the other day that there's a typo in one of the recipes in this book. So if you're making the um, Cheesecakes World Brownies, it says two 16 ounce boxes of cream cheese for the cheesecake layer. It was supposed to say two eight ounce boxes for 16 total ounces of cream cheese. Oh. So it won't like completely ruin the recipe, but it's not going to come out the way I wanted it to come out for everybody. So it's going to be really cheesy. Yeah, very cream cheesy. Yeah. That's a, an important note. But yeah, I mean, these things happen all the time, obviously, even when you have layers of editors and other people checking your work, um, it happens. Sure. And hey, I do not mean to, to dominate the conversation. If people have questions, please either throw them in the chat or if they want to un, we could unmute people if they want to ask them themselves. Um, yeah, I love questions. So. Okay. And I'll just, I keep saying, I'll just do one more. Is it, is it like uh, asking about your three children? Like, which is your favorite recipe in here? Favorite? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's really hard to choose a favorite. Um, lately, I have been saying that the cover recipe is my favorite. I made it recently um, for one of the, my press events. Um, and it's just, it's really good. There's something very nostalgic <laughs> about it. It's a chocolate chip cake. So vanilla cake with little mini chocolate chips studded throughout. And um, this really delicious thick fudge frosting um, that comes together in a food processor, which is really nice. Um, here's one of your testers now. Here's Jack right now. Yeah. Ah. Um, let's see. Okay, this might be done. Let's see here. Yeah, this looks better. So now it's totally like uniformly brown throughout before it was a little bit lighter in the center. But you see, you've got a good distribution of apples there. And let's see. Well, yeah, it's much springier. You could, so, you know, you can obviously test it Hi, with a knife Hi, Jack. <laughs> or a tape tester. It should come out clean, which it does. Um, and again, the residual heat from the pan will keep it cooking a little bit. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really hot, obviously, right now from the oven. Normally, I would wait probably 10 to 15 minutes before drizzling on the glaze, um, just because, I mean, it'll taste the same and great either way, but I like kind of a thicker, heftier glaze on top. And since it's really hot, when I do it right now, it might melt a little bit more into the cake. Um, but in the sake of time, I'm gonna re-whisk up our glaze, which is still nice and horrible. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and do the glaze right now while the cake is hot. You can do it again, like I said, now while it's hot, it'll just melt into the cake a little bit more. But there's no real rhyme or reason to the way I'm doing this. Like I said, I like to kind of just splatter it all over to get that apple fritter donut vibe. No. 
smells so good. The brown butter mixed with the apples and the cinnamon and maple. Just wanna make sure it gets into the, all the corners. If you want, you could um, take a spatula and kind of spread it before it starts to set, spread it to make sure it kind of- Gets everywhere. Gets everywhere. But and I like- It, it like settles in on top of the apples a little bit too, which is- Yeah, kind of exactly. I like the look of it like this. It's a little more casual. It looks like something that maybe came right out of the fryer. Um, there we have it. So, let's see if I can show you here. Get a little closer. See that shiny blade? It sort of started to melt in a little bit. It just but. looks really great. It looks lovely. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, and it's delicious and you can, you know, cut it. Um, a tip for cutting it into even slices is to go in halves. So I cut the cake in half this way, and then I cut those two pieces in half, and then I do oh. the same this way, and that's how I get my even slices. Um, so I'm not kind of like eyeballing. That's a, great, that's a great idea, actually, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. That way you get a little bit more even slices, and you can go as big or as small as you want as you keep sort of halving and halving the slices. But there we have it, there's our apple fritter cake. I'm not gonna cut into it this minute because it's so hot from the oven and I think it would kind of lose its shape on me and get a little, get a little dicey. Um, but that's, there we go. It's have. not yet dinner, it's not yet dessert time out there in Seattle. <laughs> right, and on the West Coast here, we, we've gotta wait, unfortunately. It's, and, and it's hard not to imagine that this wouldn't go really well with something from uh, your first book, the Sheet Pan Suppers book. Yes, so here's, I have that here too. Your sheet pan suppers. Mm. Similar idea. Everything is cooked on a sheet pan, but um, this is a savory book. So there is a short dessert chapter in here, um, but it's more about appetizers and main dishes sort of all cooked together on a sheet pan. Um, and the idea is kind of minimal fuss, maximum flavor. And I mean, it's a dumb thing to say, but it's just such a it's such a brilliant idea that it's hard to imagine it hasn't always been around. So thank you for. <laughs> well, I, you know, it may always have been around. It certainly has been in restaurant kitchens. They've, they've been using sheet pens forever, but the idea of bringing it to the home cook and, um, you know, doing one meal, one big dessert on a sheet pan, it does just make a lot of sense. Um, so I'm glad that people are, um, have, you know, it's caught on and people are into the idea. Yeah, I think last summer uh, the Times did a whole pullout section. You know, the New York Times called Sheet Pan Everything. Yes, and, and it was a whole Clark, special. Once the Clark from the New York Times has gotten very into the sheet pan thing too, which is awesome, I think. Yeah, really well done. And and Gretchen's asking uh, for some vanilla ice cream with a piece of your cake, please. Absolutely, that's a great call. So, do we have other? We must have some other questions out there. Or is everybody just? sort of ready for their own dessert. I, I'm not quite, um, it's hard to imagine what the next thing would be, but. Hi Molly, this is Anne. I, you had me at two cups of sugar. So I'm, <laughs> I'm just uh, uh, trying to keep my drooling down to a, the barest minimum. Uh, it, it looks so easy to do and so delicious. Thank you. And I probably all of us are smacking ourselves upside the head. Like, why were we not doing this before forever? I'm curious if you grew up with a really wonderful cook in your family who inspired you or where where did you get your motivation to do this so brilliantly? Yeah, that's a great question. I did. So my, um, my parents kind of were both busy professionals, did a little bit of cooking, but not a ton. Um, but my Aunt Maggie... Um, who I grew up in Philadelphia and she lives in Minneapolis. So not super close geographically, but she would come visit us uh, a lot over the years and or over the year. And she um, worked for Pillsbury in their test kitchen. Um, so I have memories of baking with her at the counter. We made sugar cookies like all the time. And then Thanksgiving was like a big, still is a really big holiday <clears throat> in our house. And she was always at the helm making all the pies. Um, so I learned a lot from her, but I really didn't start cooking or baking myself until 
after college, I would say. Um, I lived in a dorm all four years at school, so I never had my own kitchen. And then when I got out of college and had my own apartment, um, I had a lot of fun experimenting in the kitchen uh, when I would come home from my day job, which was like, you know, a kind of grown up, put your suit on, go to work type of thing, um, which turns out wasn't really for me. And I much preferred being in the kitchen. So that's, that's how I got here. <laughs> Oh, very cool. Looks like we have a question from Leslie, who um, is adoring your, your oven mitts. Could you show them to the camera again, please? I can. They're a little dirty. Hopefully they don't come across too dirty. They're called of gloves. And you can really hold anything. I mean, they're, they're not exactly asbestos, but they're, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, they, they work really well. Like I said, I was sort of skeptical when I was gifted them and thought that they looked ridiculous. They do look ridiculous, but they work really well. So we have another question. It's, uh, I own sheet pan suppers. It is a great time saver and has some amazing recipe recipes. In fact, I liked it so much that I purchased a copy as a gift. So that's not really a question, but uh, uh, actually a compliment. Um, Thank you. And another audience member says, I have of gloves and they are really the best. So they they look like they're much more- um, You should start a fan club, yeah. It's yeah. Just... It looks like you have much more control over, over what you're doing with your fingers with a glove rather than what we typically think of as an oven mitt. Yeah. yeah, and I was finding I kept like sticking my thumb into stuff when I was using the oven mitt. You just don't have quite the amount of control, I find. And, you know, these are still, the fingers can be a little clunky, but I do find I have a lot more control when handling hot stuff. Be the what are your uh, go-to all-time necessary tools? I, I love the long spatula. I yeah. don't have to own one, but that's definitely a... Um, yes, that's a really cool big offset spatula. I also have a bunch of smaller ones for a little bit more detail, like frosting, swirling, stuff like that. Um, I love just like a simple balloon whisk. And obviously I have a ton of these rubber spatulas. Um, what else? A good sharp knife. I like this one from, is it Shun? I think it's Shun. Um, and I like the size. I have bigger chef's knives too, but I find this one is a good, it might be like, I don't know, maybe six, five or six inches or so. Um, I have good control with that. Um, yeah, I, I kind of stick with the basics. I do, I have a KitchenAid mix stand mixer that I use a lot. And um, it does, some of the recipes in this book do call for a mixer, either handheld or stand mixer like that. Um, but I tried to do as many as I could that were just like bowls, whisks, spatulas. Um, but those are the basics. And like I said, this wide peeler, which is really great for peeling apples or carrots or anything that you need to get the skin off of. Gretchen, Gretchen and I are both thinking about your sheet pans. So she wanted to know if you like the non-stick sheet pans or stainless or aluminum ones. And I'm wondering if you're thinking about this all at once, if there's a very a varied weight that um, somebody should look for if they're buying a sheet pan. You know, it's funny. I did. I never owned a, a non-stick sheet pan until I started testing for this book. Um, it is nice to have the non-stick coating when you're doing baking recipes, in particular, you know, cakes and stuff. Although it does make it a little tricky, like for cutting, because obviously, you know, you're gonna wear your pan down quicker if you're cutting on that non-stick surface. Um, but I do find it pretty nice for a lot of baking and, you know, especially for something like those rolled cakes where you do want to turn it out, having a nonstick coating is nice. Um, but up until, you know, last year, I had just the regular <clears throat> aluminum or stainless steel. Um, both were great. I like um, the ones I've had forever, forever are from Chicago Metallic. I think I have some Nordic wear ones. This one is from Crate and Barrel. I know William Sonoma does that like gold touch nonstick, which are quite nice. Um, one of the things that I love about sheet pans is that they're fairly democratic. You're not going to get a huge swing in how much you're going to pay for one. Um, you know, if you go to a restaurant supply store, you could probably get one for like 10 or 15 bucks. Um, these sort of fancier versions 
will run you back maybe $40 or so. Um, but it's not like a, you know, like a nice Dutch oven or a Le Creuset stove, something like that, where you're spending hundreds of dollars on one piece of equipment. Um, but no, it's sort of, it's personal preference. And um, as long as you're using a true half sheet pan, so the right size, um, jelly roll pans look like sheet pans, but they're smaller. Um, and the problem with using a jelly roll pan is that, um, you know, if I were to put this amount of batter in the jelly roll pan, it would be too much batter for the pan to handle and it would overflow and spill in the oven. So the material and like the brand matters less than making sure you're using the right size pan. Do, do you use parchment ever in terms of lining the pans or do you like to prefer, prefer to bake right on the surface? I love parchment. Um, I, I mean, one of the really nice things about working on a sheet pan is that they sell parchment that's pre-cut in rectangles that fit a sheet pan perfectly. So I recommend splurging on those. Um, they're just so easy. I just grab it from the can't, you know, the pantry, throw it on, and then I can bake my sheet pan of cookies or whatever I'm making um, and not worry about the sticking. Yeah. We have a question about, uh, have you considered a sheet pan cookbook for vegetarians? And after you answer that, I also wanna know what, are you working on another book already? Um, I have not considered a full sheet pan book for vegetarians. There is a vegetarian chapter in sheet pan suppers. Um, Cause I do, I eat meat, but I eat kind of, I try to eat it sparingly for, you know, climate reasons and health reasons. Um, so, you know, there's everything in here, but there is a, a vegetarian chapter, um, but it's not something I've thought about in terms of putting a whole book together. And then um, do I have plans for the, another book? Not yet, no. Um, if, you know, the wheels are always turning and uh, if I were to do another book, um, I might consider doing something for more like specialized diets, like gluten-free, maybe dairy-free. Um, I just think, you know, since, especially since having kids, um, I have three now, my body's a lot different than it once was. It kind of reacts to things differently than it did. Um, and so I've been, it, it's kind of ironic because I just came out with this like very highly full of gluten cookbook, but I have found that I do better with less or no gluten. So something like that might be, it's definitely interesting to me because I haven't really delved into that world yet. And I do think that a lot of people um, like to eat that way these days. Um, but, you know, I still want dessert even though I don't want all the gluten. So that um, that's interesting to me. Yeah, the, the gluten-free cookbooks uh, tend to go out a lot. I don't know about you guys over in Hotchkiss, um, but our, our gluten-free goes, goes out a lot. Um, Gretchen wanted to know, uh, do you recommend substituting one-to-one -one gluten free, free flour in your regular flour recipe? Is it, so is it a one-to-one -one or is there a, a percentage? Well, it depends on the brand of gluten-free flour that you're using. Um, I've tested a couple with, um, I like the Bob's Red Mill, the blue bag of Bob's Red Mill, which can be substituted one for one. Um, but you just want to make sure that you're really looking at the bag and making sure that it says you can substitute this one for one because some of the gluten-free flours you can't. Um, so that's just something to pay attention to. I think we should say, is there, are there, if there are any other questions, I just want to eat what is in front of you. <laughs> it's very hard to think of a question when all I can do is look at that sheet pan. Thank you, Anne, for admitting that on all our behalfs. I feel the same <laughs> way. <laughs> to it, actually. Well, we, um, oh, look at this. Amazing. Still a little bit too hot to cut, but. Oh, um, that gooey, just looks perfect. Delicious. Gooey apple, mm. a warm kind of spice cake. This is a this is a keeper. This recipe. I'm excited to eat that once it cools down a little bit. It's still hot. Well, this is just it. I mean, Anne, I couldn't agree more. It's we just all need to go home and have something that's not too indulgent, but but kind of will motivate us to check the book out of the library. 
Your neighbors will thank you for sure. <laughs> That's right. As Holly mentioned earlier, one of our library staff members is in Seattle right now getting ready for her daughter's wedding tomorrow evening. So perhaps she could, you know, I was we should call her. Bring, <laughs> bring a sheet pen back, carry on for us for next week in the library. Yeah. I don't think uh, they'd let her on the plane without sharing with everyone, though. So we probably wouldn't get any. It wouldn't last. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, well, Molly, this has really been a terrific evening. I uh, obviously I've enjoyed it, and I'm sure our guests have as well. It's just it it's uh, both in, inspiring in terms of how you can use this relatively new technique, but to turn out really fabulous. Um, recipes and meals for friends and people you love and people you don't even know yet and uh, it's it's just terrific I can't I can't thank you enough for both doing the book and then being such a wonderful teacher about it you, you really have been really um, you're really a good clear explainer in your technique and as somebody just said it's impressive to see you turn out a recipe in real time yeah. That's really impressive. I think you need a cooking show is what you need. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Right. We'll Thank be you guys. Your, it was a pleasure to be here. We'll be your Thank sheet you pan so fan much. club. There you go. Um, love it. I love it. Yes. Yeah, I'm in. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. We we wish you the best. I hope you've got more, lots more uh wonderful little evenings like this set up with other libraries and bookstores around the country, because I'm sure the book will be a success and become a mainstay like the, the supper book has been.